Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, today's reading is from Colossians chapter 2, verses, Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 to 6. And you'll find that on your screen or, or in your service booklets if you've printed them off or in your own Bibles at home. Please follow along. Devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door to us for the message, to speak the mystery of the Messiah, for which I'm in prison, so that I may reveal it as I am required to speak. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the time. Your speech should always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you should answer each person. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm going to spend a bit of time with you now working through that passage and you can take notes as an outline on the screen or in your service sheets if you've printed them off. There's a comments box at the bottom of the page and you can uh, send an email to Neil or myself with any questions, queries or feedback that you might have. Well, the goodness of so much that we've learned from Colossians can be, if we take it seriously, a little overwhelming. Jesus is enough. Jesus as Lord is enough. You've been transferred and so transformed. His story is now your story. The clear warning of the danger of the false teaching that tells you that Jesus is not enough. The lifting up of our eyes and minds and hearts to where our lives are stored with our Lord in heaven. Live as you are, putting off and putting on the goodness of living as individuals in community. All that is phrased in the plural. This is what it looks like to be part of God's mob. His community, the citizens together of the kingdom of God's beloved Son. Not only is that overwhelming, but the goodness of living as such a community can be used to distract us, perhaps even bring us down a slippery little path into our own collective belly buttons. God's mob can become so focused inward on the goodness of this, our community, that we forget the world we live in. The times we inhabit, the fact that we've been watched by the whole world, that we have a message that this world desperately needs to hear. And so this closing section, it's simple and concise to the point, wants us to live as we are, knowing that the world watches. Let me pray. Father, we're only looking at a small passage today, but it packs a big and confronting punch, which if applied wisely under the guidance of your spirit can not only transform your community but transform the community we live in father help us to seriously consider these words and apply them in jesus name amen well it's worth noticing the simple structure of the passage uh, to do that explains the logic of where we're going allows us to see how we're going to pick up concepts as we work our way through it uh, the passage hangs off two commands. One in verse 2, be busy or devoted. One in verse 5, walk. Of each command are a series of subordinate clauses which explain, unpack, extend that command or exhortation. And we're going to divide the passage into four exhortations for God's people to live as you are, with an eye to the outsider, knowing that they are watching us. Now, I don't think it's a complicated passage. I don't think its commands are that complicated. Moreover, in its emphasis on word and deed, it's really just another extended application of Colossians 3.17. Tangible, concrete statements that we walk in such a way that we reflect on the reputation and interests of Jesus as Lord. In fact, Jesus as Lord has already made us who we are. This is just expressing what we've already been given. Remember Colossians 3, 1 to 4, live as you are. The complication comes as we try to apply what this looks like in our daily lives. And that complication is not so much the nature of the commands, but my stubborn nature, my unwilling nature in applying them. Well, look at verse 2. Devote yourselves to prayer. Stay alert in it with thanksgiving. A language used here is of being devoted and disciplined, consistently so. 
The command is very simple. Be devoted in prayer. Be devoted in prayer. I'm at point two on the outline. Now, we know what prayer is, don't we? In fact, the saints here at Narrabri only two years ago had a sermon series on prayer. Prayer, first and foremost, is a statement of dependence upon God as our creator and sustainer. Just look at Matthew chapter 6 as Jesus unpacks prayer around the Lord's Prayer. It's an acknowledgement that we are reliant upon God in all parts of our lives. It's a submission to the Lordship of Jesus, knowing that he rules our lives, having transferred and transformed us. And after all these, it's a statement of request before God. Well, God's people are to be devoted to prayer. That's a communal command. It's a mark of the community of God's people. Uh, in this, God's people are stating that they exist dependent upon God. Uh, it's no surprise if you've been following along in Colossians, is it? After all, God himself through Jesus has, compl- has granted us a complete transfer from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of God's Son. A complete transformation. Jesus' story is now your story. A whole new identity. In everything, we're dependent as God's people. Prayer expresses this communally. It's not unusual in the New Testament. Just listen to Acts chapter 2, verse 42, a description of the early church. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. Acts 2, 46, and every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple complex and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favour with all people. Just listen to Acts chapter 6, verse 4. But we will devote ourselves to prayer, the apostles say, and to the preaching ministry. And if you've got your Bibles there, turn with me to Romans chapter 12, verse 12. Rejoice in hope, be patient in affliction, Be persistent or devoted in prayer. All the same combinations of words. Devoted and prayer. It's a mark of God's people right from the early church, even into the capital of the whole Roman Empire, to God's people gathered there. And we're given two elaborations of that, of what praying looks like there in verse 2. On the one hand, God's mob had to stay alert. I think a better understanding is be watchful. It seems to capture the general way this specific word is used right throughout the rest of the New Testament. It's an awareness of the times that God's people live in and in between times, from the ascension of Jesus to the return of Jesus. Remember Colossians 3 verse 4? These are limited times. There's an end point in sight and coming. These are finite times. God has set their finish and we're moving towards it. These are times when the domain of darkness stands in sharp contrast, stark and clear against the kingdom of God's Son. And we live in opposition. We must be watchful in our prayers. On the other hand, the prayers of God's people are to be with thanksgiving. You shouldn't be surprised about that. It's been a constant thread here since Colossians chapter 3 captures consistently the goodness of what God's people have been granted, what they've received. Remember how I began at the start there, giving you a map, a rundown of the overwhelming goodness of what God has lavished on his people in Jesus, the complete sufficiency of the Lordship of Jesus for all of life, so that we want for nothing now and eternally. What an encouragement to be thankful So God's people are to be dependent, displayed in watchful and thankful prayer. When was the last time you consistently, devotedly joined in communal prayer? Can I say that I think the emphasis here is on communal prayer. It's not something just addressed to individuals, but to the mob meeting to pray, to communally gather and pray together. We can do that in our Bible study groups. We can do that as a church community on the first Sunday evening of every month with our parish prayer meeting. We can do it as fellas gathered on a Thursday morning. We can do that whenever someone comes for a meal 
or a cup of tea or drops in. We can pray together. But when? When was the last time you were devoted to that? When was the last time that your communal prayer was watchful? When it had an eye on the times we live in, times that are finite, limited, with the return of Jesus looming? When was the last time that our communal prayer was thankful, really thankful, deeply thankful, all-encompassing thankful? Look at verse 3 and 4. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door to us for the message to speak the mystery of the Messiah for which I'm in prison so that I may reveal it as I am required to speak. And that point three on the outline, verse three is really a subordinate clause of the command in verse two, another elaboration of what devoted prayer looks like. But it has a slightly different emphasis, a slightly different term. Uh, the structure here is interesting. There's a subclause that unpacks another aspect of what it looks like to pray, and then two purpose clauses that really focus on Paul's circumstance. His circumstance is not salubrious, is it? He's in jail. He's imprisoned. I suspect that he's under house arrest, which is why Timothy and so many others can gather with him. Under such circumstances, his request is frankly surprising, isn't it? In these circumstances, he doesn't ask for prayer about his release. He doesn't ask for prayer that requests the easing of his strictures. He doesn't ask for prayer for a change in his physical well-being. His perspective is much bigger, much grander, much more significant. He wants to keep doing his job. Remember Colossians 1, 24 to 29? In all truth, this is a requirement. That's how he describes it, a necessity. An essential expectation of him as someone representing Jesus. His request is even more surprising than that. It's not just that he do his job. His desire is not that he have an opportunity to go through doors. No, his request is that doors be opened for him to speak the mystery of the Messiah, the good news of Jesus, through. Paul's focus is on the proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ, for that to be free, proclaimed, even as the messenger is in chains. In fact, as the messenger is chained, his tongue is not. And so he desires for God to open doors for the word of salvation to be spoken, transmitted and heard. In essence, Paul's asking for prayer that he is able to do his job, the job of proclamation. In essence, Paul is asking for prayer to be focused on the message of Jesus spoken and sailing through doors that have been closed physically to him in chains. As it's always been the case in his life, God has worked an outwardly prioritised viewpoint, concern in Paul and Timothy. Their desire is for the good news of Jesus to move out through the doors opened by God. This is most important, the most important, the most necessary part of their life as God's community. It's no wonder that this is his prayer in prison. After all, imprisonment will do that to you, won't it? It will strip you back to what is necessary. When was the last time we prayed as a community gathered together with such outwardly focused priorities? On October the 4th, we'll have such an opportunity. It'll be by Zoom, but we will gather for our monthly prayer meeting and we will pray for mission, for doors to be opened for the proclamation of the good news of Jesus in the world. And when was the last time we prayed as a community with such outwardly focused priorities? I mean, when did we pray each week for an opportunity for us to speak the good news of Jesus into our town, into our family, into our friendships, our work, for all the doors in those places to be opened by God 
for the good news of Jesus to go through. Now, before we go further into this portrait of God's people living as they are being watched by the world, let me make a clarifying comment. The focus of this letter is communal. You've heard me say that again and again, ad nauseum. It picks up the plural structure of all the verbs in the letter, the plural pronouns. It picks up the fact that it would have been read to the community gathered. And in this day when Christianity can be so individualised, when we can privatise it so much, when we can shape our life as Christians to suit my circumstances, my life choices, my work choices, this is a useful and needed corrective. Christianity is never private. Christianity is always corporate. We're saved into a mob, into a community. But as we heard last week, we're individuals in community. And so whilst Christianity is never private, it is personal. And we must apply these commands to our own daily living as God's people. These aspects of the community must be evident in our daily lives as God's people and to fail to grasp that balance, it's the right balance of individual and community. To fail to grasp that balance is to fall into one of two errors. On the one hand, it's to fall into the error of being a Sunday Christian, someone who does these things when they're part of the mob but puts them aside when they're away from the mob for the rest of the week. On the other hand, it's to fall into apathy and privatisation. If the rest of the mob's doing it, at least some committed individuals are doing it, then I don't have to in any way. It's about between me and God. Both are wrong. We're individuals in community. As a community, we're dependent in prayer and outwardly focused. As individuals in community, we're the same. Well, look at verse 5. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the time. I'm at point four on the outline. It's the second command of this section. Remember I said at the start there are two commands, one in verse two, the second in verse five. It returns us to the key principle of the whole letter, doesn't it? Remember Colossians 2, 6 and 7. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, walk in him. This whole section started with walking. Paul's favourite metaphor for life as God's people, and it finishes with walking. The walking has an audience, a relationship, the outsiders. Well, who, who are the outsiders? Well, if this is addressed to God's people, who've been transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of God's Son and so transformed, chapter 1, 13 and 14, then the outsiders are those still in the domain of darkness outside the kingdom of God's Son. Now, that's confronting language in our day and age, isn't it? A society we live in which struggles with truthful conflict and labelling, that's confronting. But it is truthful, isn't it? The outsiders are those who don't walk with Jesus as Lord, who remain enemies of God, who are hostile and alienated, who have not known the transformation that comes with his life is now your life, who live clothed in the old man, and God's people walk amongst them, and their walk must be wise. And what does it mean to be wise? Well, in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, we're told that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And Psalm 19, verse 9 places the fear of the Lord as something granted through the right understanding and application of the word of God. So to walk wisely is to walk in such a way that the word of God has influenced your relationship with God to the right relationship, brought you to Jesus as Lord and Saviour, that you might display him, his reputation and character in your daily living. Let me just say that all again. To walk wisely 
is to walk in such a way that the word of God has so influenced and changed your relationship with God, brought you to Jesus as Lord and Saviour, that you display him, his reputation and character in your daily living. To be wise in this way is to be someone who applies the watchfulness from verse 2 in their daily living. They live appropriate for the times. In this sense, they make the most of their time. They don't waste time. They live now knowing that this time is limited. They walk amongst people who are destined for hell. And so they live like it. That doesn't mean withdrawal from life in the world. We live here. But it does mean intentionality. Being intentional with life, in life, through life. Intentionality that knows that Jesus as Lord is enough, that knows that the need of outsiders is to hear the good news. An intentionality which has its roots sunk deeply into God's word and prayer as the foundation for daily living. That's helpful in theory, isn't it? I think it is. Starting to see the connection between wisdom, fear of the Lord, and God's word as the foundation, but what might it look like practically? I'm so glad Paul and Timothy think the same. Well, look at verse 6. It unpacks, and I'm at point 5 on the outline. Your speech should always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you should answer each person. There's the explanation. The explanation of what it looks like practically to walk with wisdom. And it's worth unpacking slowly. A wisely walking person who belongs to Jesus as Lord has speech which is always gracious. In that sense, the speaking of God's mob at all times is full of grace. Just like their relationships as God's community are. Remember Colossians 3, 12 to 13? That doesn't mean it's flowery speech. doesn't mean it's archaic speech. It doesn't even mean that it's quiet in volume. This is speech that has the flavour of Jesus and the way he's treated his mob, giving them what they do not deserve. And what does that look like? Well, it's to be salty in your speech. Did you see that there in verse 6? It's to have speech that is full of flavour, and full of preservation. It's not an accident, this type of speech. The tense there is past. There's been a preparation of the speaker over a period of time. Remember reading God's word and being dependent in prayer? And so prepared, it speaks into daily life in such a way that the true flavour of life, the true preservative of life, is presented in all its tastiness. In essence, it's making sure that the mystery of Jesus is constantly present in conversation because this is what is sufficient for all of life. This is the true flavour and preservative. Now, that does not mean sanctimonious language. It does not mean frilly language. It does not mean goody-two-shoes language. It does not even mean making sure that every conversation has the full gospel and a call to repentance every time. But it is conversation, speech and word, that doesn't waste an opportunity to inject God and his grace into the words. It's prepared language. It's ready and organised to know how to speak to the queries of the world around us. It means that the speaker, you, me, has made the effort as one of God's people to be marinated in God's word, marinated in dependent prayer, thoughtful about the world we live in, and then willing to speak. Let me be blunt. There is a watchful intentionality here in language and life that aims to put grace, the very thing we've received from Jesus, in front of the outsider in such a way that it is tasty, it is faithful, 
and preserving of life as God intended it to be. It's to live and speak in such a way that Jesus is represented faithfully and it reflects rightly on his priorities and interests. And the aim, well, the aim is so that the outsider is answered and meets Jesus in us as a mob and as in the individuals in the mob. It means, let me get even more tactile if you want concrete, it means playing touch football intentionally. It means joining the RFS intentionally. It means participating in craft groups intentionally. Intentionally aiming in language and life to put Jesus front and centre. It might mean making certain ministry choices that we don't start a group specific ministry because one already exists in town and we should go and join that one. It might mean shopping at the same shops to relate to the same people time and time again so that Jesus is presented in language and life. It might mean making sure that we understand the issues of our time, the themes of the moment, the culture of our community so that we can speak in language and life the mystery of Jesus into it. It means bringing grace to each and every conversation and interaction in such a way that the time is not wasted. Let me say openly that I daily live with the regret of being either unprepared for conversations or too fearful of such moments. It is a daily regret in my life I suspect it could be in yours. So as we think on this walk with the world watching, watching us being focused outwardly as we walk as individuals in community, let me finish by asking how you are getting prepared for such conversations and conduct. Are you marinating? Are you being seasoned? How are you reading the word and praying as a community, as an individual, in such a way that there is a constant dependence, a constant outward focused priority, a constant wise walking and salty conversation, which puts Jesus in our life and language in front of the outsider? How are you marinating? How are you being seasoned? Let me pray. Dear God, thank you that through Jesus you have granted us so much that we did not deserve. You have transferred and transformed us and now you've placed us as a community of individuals in community in a town full of outsiders. Father, Help us to be a dependent people, dependent upon you, watchful, thankful. Help us to have an outwardly focused set of priorities, praying for doors to be opened for the truth of Jesus to go through. Father, help us to walk wisely in such a way that we waste not a moment. Father, help us to be salty in our life and language so that outsiders meet the goodness of Jesus as Lord being enough. Amen.